Well, these are industries that are making a, a great deal of corporate profits at, the, at this moment. So we've seen record levels of profits over the last couple of years. Then the actual amount of reduction that has to take place relative to a 2019 baseline is less than 1%. <laughs> the big lifting is done by cheap policies like methane, We're reducing our reliance on fossil fuels. We're reducing our household energy costs. We're reducing emissions. That sounds like a win-win to me. Welcome to another edition of the Environment in Canada podcast, a podcast about the environment in Canada by Sierra Club Canada. I'm Connor Curtis, Head of Communications with Sierra Club Canada, and today I'm going to be talking with Aaron Cosby and Jessica Kelly about the emissions cap in Canada that's being proposed on the oil and gas corporations that are the lion's share of Canada's emissions, our dependency on oil and gas and some of the economic problems that inherently has, why a lot of the inflation we're seeing has very little to nothing to do with climate policy, but has a lot to do with our dependency upon oil and gas as products and the exposure we leave ourselves open to in terms of global impacts, provided we stay dependent upon those products. We're also going to talk a little bit about renewables. We're going to talk a little bit about energy efficiency. We're going to talk about how, while the media focus on those has often been on supposed unreliabilities that really aren't that much of a problem, we haven't talked about the unreliability of continued reliance upon oil and gas. We're also going to talk about two emissions cap related studies that came out claiming the cap was going to cost the economy and why those are extremely problematic and basically have results that are rigged from the beginning. And we are going to talk about advice for journalists in covering environmental policy topics, given some of the headlines we see on a regular basis that then turn out to be problematic afterwards. Before we begin, just a reminder that you can take action on environmental issues by visiting sierraclub.ca. We have tons of petitions, including, as of this broadcast, a petition on the emissions cap. Other actions and events and regular news updates you can sign up for on the homepage. You can also find Sierra Club Canada on social media, and you can listen to the Environment in Canada podcast on the Harbinger Media Network, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, iHeartRadio, and YouTube, or wherever you get your podcasts. This podcast also airs on CKUT Broadcast Radio in Montreal, 90.3 FM, bi-weekly on Tuesdays at 11 a.m. AT. Don't forget to click follow or subscribe to get the latest episodes from us. Hi, Aaron and Jessica. Thank you for joining me today. Nice to be here. here. So for those tuning in, who are you and what do you do? Uh, My name is Jessica Kelly. I'm a senior policy advisor with the International Institute for Sustainable Development, working with the Energy Programme here in Canada, and I'm based in Winnipeg, Manitoba. My educational background is in international development studies and political science, and I refer to myself as a recovering public servant, having done a little over a decade of policy and legislative analysis, program design, development, project management, and the whole gamut. So very pleased to be here and very pleased to be doing this work. And I'm Aaron Cosby. I'm a senior associate, a colleague of Jessica's at the International Institute for Sustainable Development. Coming to you from the hinterlands of British Columbia today, where I'm based. I'm trained as an economist. My long, I've, I've been with ISD for over three decades now, it's hard to believe. My longer background is on trade and investment policy. And for the last 20 years or so, I've also done climate policy. And that's taken me to areas like green industrial policy, border carbon adjustment, trade measures, but also to Canadian climate policy. And that's what we'll talk about today, I guess. So I want to dive straight into our first question, which is climate policy often gets framed in the Canadian public debate as a cost to Canadians. But there's a new report that the IISD just came out with, how fossil fuels drive inflation and make life less affordable for Canadians. And it indicates that our overdependence on oil and gas is what's driving inflation. I'm curious if you can get a bit more into some of the findings and what you found. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to dig into this research in, in a slightly retrospective manner, as we all know, we've gone through one of the largest inflationary spikes in Canada's history, a 40-year record inflation of 8.1% that hit in 2022. And that inflation wave was largely driven by, by three primary items. So that was energy, food, and shelter costs. And those three items contributed more than 60% of Canada's overall inflation 
in that peak June 2022 period. Those factors played an even more substantial role in the acceleration observed in the previous year. But when we look at energy crisis specifically, and this is what people will remember very much so from this pandemic and post-pandemic and Russia invasion of Ukraine and all of the factors that went into rising oil and gas prices internationally. And what people really recall from from that period is the the rising cost of of gas, diesel, and of natural gas too, which has typically not been as subject to international pricing dynamics as it is now. But when we look specifically at energy, and when we talk about energy in Canada, we are talking about fossil fuels. Our primary energy sources, 75% of our primary energy is, is fossil fuels in Canada, despite our abundance of hydroelectric energy. So focusing in on that primary energy source, energy cost spikes accounted for a third of Canada's overall inflation from that February 2021 to June 2022 acceleration of inflation, 33%. And when energy costs spike, a wide range of other items are going to be impacted. It's like the tide that lifts all boats. When we think about inflation, price inflation can occur for for sort of one of two reasons. It's either going to be a demand-driven price inflation, which is consumer demand, high consumer demand-driven price inflation, but it can also occur due to rising input costs. And we think of energy as an input into the various goods and services that people consume on a day-to-day basis. So when an economy is unable to stabilize or lower its energy costs, those prices of those energy intensive items are going to increase. The price paid for fossil fuel based energy in Canada and many developed regions is subject to wild fluctuations. So that can be due to supply and demand changes in international oil and gas markets. We're seeing disruptions due to increased climate related disruptions Geopolitical conflict, of course, is a, a perennial issue with oil and gas oil and gas prices internationally. And we are also seeing gas prices, natural gas prices now fluctuating more due to the globalization of regional natural gas markets into international markets. So all of this volatility is taking place in our energy sector. And so when you can't rely on a stable source or a stable price of energy, it means you have to hedge your bets. This type of vulnerability was really on display in that post-pandemic recovery period. Some energy price changes that occur slowly or predictably, such as, say, a carbon price, can be absorbed by profit margins. They can be planned out, they can be anticipated. But these larger energy price shocks or repeated energy price shocks that occur over a greater length of time are more likely to result in increased costs being passed on to consumers. And so what are these types of second round effects? Well, anything food related from growing to transportation to storage, all of those processes are very energy intensive. And so when your energy prices rise, those prices are going to, those costs are going to trickle down through restaurants and any sort of food related industry. Transportation, of course, Canada is a, a very road reliant country. <laughs> Cost of uh, car rentals, postal services, delivery services, any repair services that are going out, air transportation, anything that's energy intensive, even laundry services, um, materials for the maintenance repair of housing, all of these secondary items are subject to the cost of energy inputs. And so when we see incredible spikes in fossil fuel prices and oil and gas prices, those types of spikes are going to trickle down through the economy. It's estimated that up to 25% of the non-energy items within the consumer price index are sensitive to oil prices. So we're in a real vulnerable spot here when we know that fossil fuel prices are going to continue to go up and down and up and down. And many people believe that prices at the consumer level are going to slowly increase and stay elevated. 
So people are going to start making plans for their profit margins. And so the cost of other items are likely going to be increasing over time. Well, it's interesting because you bring in the carbon pricing question. I mean, we've seen a lot of data to suggest this is really a very small. I think when you hear energy prices affect everything, one of the first things in people's heads is going to be, well, that's the carbon price isn't helping, right? Or carbon pricing is the problem. Mm -hmm. What's your Mm -hmm. take on that? We have to put a price on pollution. The carbon pricing system is a system that is being adopted by dozens of countries across the globe now. It is a necessary tax on the emissions that are being created through the consumption of this product. And it is meant to discourage its use, which I would argue not only from an environmental standpoint, but really from an economic standpoint, as the paper gets into, is really for the consumer's benefit. And when we look at that inflationary growth that happened in the post-pandemic period, the height of gasoline prices, consumers are paying you know, over $2 two dollars a liter of gasoline on average in Canada. From a year prior, that was that was a 73 cent per liter price increase, a significant increase of about 55%. But only three cents of that 73 cent increase was actually due to year-over-year carbon price increases. So the rest of that is due to market volatility and global events that are beyond our control. It's easy to point the finger at something like a tax when there are other aspects of pricing that are beyond our control. But fossil fuel consumption and usage is within our control. And the more that consumers lower their reliance on fossil fuels, the less the carbon tax is going to have an impact on their day-to-day costs. Well, and it's something definitely we've seen from, you know, a number of economists now who have come out, I think it's over 400 who've come out and said that the mm-hmm. actual impact of carbon tax on inflation, even with the knock-on effects, is minimal. It's the least of our worries in terms of inflation. With climate policy specifically seems to get this central focus when that happens, when it has basically nothing to do with it, which is interesting. Yeah, and it's it's not to discount the very real price pressures that some communities that are incredibly reli- like overly reliant on fossil fuels are going to feel, right? When we think about, you know, when we think about our electricity grids in particular, you know, we often we think Canada has you know, abundant cheap electricity and on the whole we do. But, you know, 18%, roughly 18% of the country's electricity is actually generated from fossil fuels. And we would perhaps not be surprised to learn that Alberta and Saskatchewan have roughly 80 percent of their of their electricity generated from fossil fuel energy. So when you think on economies of scale and the magnitude of energy that is required in these provinces, the electricity that's required in these provinces and the natural gas inputs that would go into generating that electricity, and then the carbon costs on top of that electricity, certainly you could see that there would be a bigger price tag associated. But still, the the international pricing dynamics on fossil fuels are what is driving the elevated costs of things like natural gas. And I have some handy statistics here that I'm just going to pull out in relation to the cost of, of natural gas driven electricity. Because in Canada, we've thankfully moved away from coal-generated power to a great extent. That's been fantastic. But often replace that with natural gas. So very quickly, from in 1996, natural gas use for electricity generation was at about 3%. In 2022, we're now at about 16%. So we are seeing an increase in the amount of natural gas that's used. Over about two years between 2020 and 2022, the amount of natural gas used for electricity generation in Canada increased by about 5%. But the cost of that 5% increase over that period ballooned by 151%. So from 1.9 billion in 2020 to 4.7 billion in 2022. These are higher operating costs that electricity grids will incur as a result of their reliance on natural gas. And those costs are ultimately going to be covered through electricity rates. 
Well, and I guess on it, yeah, there's lots of rural communities in, in Canada that rely upon diesel, among other things, right? There's lots of mm -hmm. places here that don't meet that norm. I think, you know, if you live in somewhere like Quebec, maybe you're used to the idea of hydropower being a major thing. If you're in Newfoundland and Labrador, similarly, there's a lot of hydro, but that's not necessarily the case for everybody. I guess my second question is, how can we best reduce this over-dependence? What is the way to, to go about that? Definitely. I mean, it's a large problem. It's a systemic problem. This paper is really focused at the at the household level and thinking about the affordability issues that you know everyday Canadians are facing. So when we are looking at the household level, it's it's really the household energy consumption. So when we think about our transportation, we're driving cars with it, you know internal combustion engines. Switching to electric vehicles is going to save on costs without a doubt. The lifetime ownership of electric vehicles as compared to internal combustion engine vehicles is already lower in many cases. And they're just getting more affordable as manufacturing improvements take place. Rebates continue to be offered. So Canadian car owners right now, they're spending on average about $200 a month on gasoline. If they were to switch to a comparable electric vehicle, they'd be paying anywhere from about $23 to $54 a month to power their, right. their vehicle. So that's a significant monthly cost already. Another way consumers can save money and reduce their dependence is through their household heating and cooling. So there's a lots of buzz about heat pumps, and rightly so. Um, electric air source heat pumps, they offer better efficiency, they offer significant cost savings as compared to gas furnaces. The lifetime costs of a standard heat pump with electric backup are estimated to be about 13% less than a gas furnace with an air conditioner. I can personally attest to this. I've taken advantage of the interest-free loan program through federal government and had a heat pump installed in my home. And my electricity bill last month was negative $80. So I'm you know, not, not saying that that's going to happen for everyone, but it's definitely had a huge impact on, on my monthly bills. That's one way that I've personally been able to reduce my household energy consumption and I'm saving money at the same time and I'm reducing emissions. And that's great. That feels really great. Another thing that consumers can do, obviously, is to just think about energy efficiency, think about the amount of energy they're consuming and start to make things more efficient for themselves. All of this electrification, though, is going to be for naught uh, if it's produced from fossil fuel energy. So one of the key things that we also need to consider and that government policies need to encourage is the installation and expansion of renewable energy sources into our electricity grids. And that's going to be really, really crucial in terms of lowering costs overall. I outlined it before, the you know, spiking costs of, of natural gas-driven electricity. Levelized cost of electricity from renewables has dropped dramatically in the last decade. I think people are still sort of like waking up to this news that it's, it costs less to generate electricity from solar and from onshore wind than it is from fossil fuel costs. Those, those costs have now dropped below the fossil fuel cost floor with respect to energy, uh, electricity generation. And the bonus of when those, elect, when those renewable sources are brought online is that once they're built and connected to the grid, their costs do not fluctuate based on international markets, based on geopolitical conflicts taking place in the Middle East. So those electricity prices can remain quite stable. Term price stability can be locked in through power purchase agreements that guarantee a price for renewables decades into the future. So we get cheaper, more stable, efficient energy through renewables powering our electricity grids that are coming into our homes, powering our heat pumps and our electric vehicles. They're saving us hundreds of dollars a month. The Canadian Electricity Advisory Council published a report back at the end of May that was quite significant, really good report. And they're estimating through a, a net zero electricity grids that households could save up to $1,500 a year. So that's a win-win. We're reducing our reliance on fossil fuels. We're reducing our household energy costs. We're reducing emissions. That sounds like a win-win too. Well, and it's not just Canada that's realizing this. I mean, I think we're seeing a, a global shift to, to renewables in part, not just driven by like, we want to do well on climate change, but just, hey, like other, there are lots of other countries out there, including developing countries that are like, 
we just don't want to be dependent upon somebody else for our energy costs. And it's funny because we always chat about the fluctuations of solar or wind, and there are lots of ways to deal with that with backup storage or batteries. Absolutely. But what we don't talk about is the fluctuations of fossil fuels, right? Like mm -hmm. the price for those can go through the roof overnight. It can go down. Right. The renewables have that much more stable price point. Mm -hmm. I, I'm curious to jump into a bit because you talk about like household change, but you talk about that systemic change and there's a, there's a policy currently framework out there that's being drafted, the emissions cap. And it's a policy that would see oil and gas companies held to their promises on emissions reductions. And already those companies are complaining that the emissions cap will ruin the economy. And I, I'm kind of curious, what do you make of this? What are maybe some of the, the benefits or downsides of the cap? Yeah, I might I might let Aaron jump in and, and speak to some of the emissions cap policies. But certainly, you know, it, when consumers are um, making behavioral changes in terms of lowering their emissions and improving their energy efficiency and doing what they can for the climate, we would certainly want to see our industry leaders emulating that behavior. We know that the oil and gas sector in Canada is responsible for the lion's share of emissions in the country. And so definitely there is some scrutiny deserved on that industry to address their emissions. Look, let's be clear. This cap actually, as proposed, allows for growth of production in the oil and gas sectors. Oil would grow by 17% by 2030 and gas by 12% by 2030, yeah. assuming that they adopt the what Environment and Climate Change Canada sees as technically achievable emissions reductions relative to a 2019 baseline. So it's not just it's not that they're shutting down the oil and gas sectors, it's just that they're not growing as much as they would like to grow and they expect to grow. Let's look at one of the reports that predicts ruin, the, the recent Deloitte report. It started by assuming that the oil and gas companies couldn't do anything in the way of methane reduction. They couldn't do anything in the way of investing in carbon capture and storage, couldn't do anything in the way of electrification or very limited, and then imposed a modeled cap on them. Well, you know, if you start with those kinds of assumptions, oh, I'm sorry, it also assumed that the baseline was a very healthy growth in production and jobs uh, that sort of belies the predictions that we've seen from reputable sources like the International Energy Agency that, that talk about peaks in global demand. So if you put all those assumptions together and you impose a cap on it, of course, the result is going to be ruinous for the Canadian economy in terms of impacts relative to the baseline. If oil companies can't do anything else other than stop production in response to a cap, then they will stop production and you'll lose a lot of jobs, you'll lose a lot of investment. But the reality is, the whole point of the cap is that you can do other things other than stock production. You can invest in methane reduction. There's 33 megatons of methane reduction achievable at an average of like $11 a ton for carbon. That's very cheap. You can do, according to the Pathways Alliance, you can do carbon capture and storage. The cap assumes about 20 megatons of that. So forgive me if I don't get concerned about the predictions for economic ruin coming out of studies like Deloitte or previously out of the uh, S&P analysis, which was the other milestone prediction of economic ruin. Their assumptions are flawed and therefore the results are flawed. We're not talking about a ruinous stop in production. Well, and as I understand the policy too, like a lot of the emissions reductions do come from methane, which is like you know, not necessarily even getting into like the super unproven technologies or sort of wild speculations about future or anything like that. Yeah. So look, 33, ton 33 megatons of the expected emissions reductions come from methane. And that's actually, that will be the result of a policy that's quite outside the cap. It will be a result of the policy that for uh, methane emission regulations that Canada's going to be putting in place. If we assume that that 33 megatons is taken out. And we assume that companies will produce up to the upper legal bound, which, which involves a, a 25 megaton cushion. Then the actual amount of reduction that has to take place relative to a 2019 baseline is less than 1%. <laughs> the big lifting is done by cheap policies like methane. There is some lifting to be done uh, uh, by policies like CCUS and get into whether that's a reasonable assumption or not. How should we be better accounting for the cost of climate change and corporate profits and designing policies? Well, these are industries that are making a, a great deal of corporate profits at, the, at this moment. So we've seen record levels of profits over the last couple of years. Unfortunately, those profits mostly uh, have gone into shareholder returns in form of dividends 
and uh, share buybacks and not into emissions reductions. So if we look at one of the two doomsaying reports that has come out recently, uh, undertaken by Deloitte, it noted that, and I don't think this was an intended headline from that report, but it noted that if we're looking at what makes most sense from a financial perspective for these companies, investing in production right now is highly profitable. In fact, investing in production right now is much more profitable than investing in emissions reductions. So they basically concluded none of these firms are going to invest in CCUS, right? Because it's much more profitable to invest in production. So if we if we take that into account, it says, well, the current carbon pricing regime isn't working. They're looking at a carbon price. They're saying we're going to make a lot more money if we just pay the carbon price and invest in continuing production and don't invest in decarbonization. So let's do that. The carbon price isn't working. What's the solution to that? Well, either you jack up the carbon price just for oil and gas, because remember, oil and gas, their carbon price is part of a broader industrial carbon pricing scheme that involves steel and cement and petrochemicals. And so either you make an exception for them and jack up their carbon price, which is highly politically unlikely, or you impose a regulatory solution that says, we're going to deal with you guys separately because you're a special case. And that's the cap. There you have it. That is one of the things we're talking about Canada's most polluting sector here. I mean, there's definitely a, a need for some sort of specific focused policy. And it really doesn't sound like, you know, the Deloitte study, when it came out, the coverage in the media was very catastrophic sounding as opposed to this kind of more nuanced. Well, actually, it's just leaving them with a choice. And most of these emissions reductions aren't actually the, the end of production for the economy or anything like that. So one of the doomsaying reports that came out about the Canadian economy and the impact on the economy from oil and gas emissions cap was authored by S&P. This is an unpublished analysis, which, I mean, my first problem with it is I can't read it and examine its uh, assumptions. But some people have seen it. And from what they talk about, the assumptions seem to be we're talking about forecast of achieving the 42% reduction in emissions in just the oil sound by 2030 would result in a drop in expected production of 1.3 million barrels a day by 2030, loss of between 4,500 and 94,000 jobs. Well, okay. So according to the reports that I've understood, S&P projections are counting on loss in production and jobs against assumed growth in the oil sands of more than a third over 2019 production by 2030. So if you start out with a baseline that says we're going to grow this industry by a third in a decade, then probably going to see some major impacts. But but <laughs> that's that's my first problem. You start from a very aggressive baseline growth. But even if we do talk about expected and, and not existing, let's let's look at employment. S and P reportedly forecast that the cap is going to eliminate between forty five hundred and ninety four hundred jobs from twenty nineteen levels by twenty thirty, and that sounds big. If you average it out, that's roughly four hundred ten to eight hundred fifty jobs a year. That still sounds big. Until you consider that actually the oil and gas sector has been shedding jobs at a rate of about 4,000 per year since 2013 as a result of automation and efficiency investments. And then it doesn't sound big anymore. This is a sector that is in decline. It's a sunset sector. I'll come back to my headline note here. The assumptions that go into that S&P report of aggressive baseline growth and the kinds of analysis they do on impact in terms of jobs, economic impacts, are are almost designed to make it look bad when it is not so bad. It's basically kind of a rigged analysis or cherry picking the situation so that you can create the outcome that you want to hear versus. And too often that seems to be the case with the industry funded analysis. I have, you know, I have no problem with a good analysis that tries to understand what the impacts of the cap are going to be because it will have impacts. It's supposed to have impacts. But if you start with those kinds of assumptions and frame it in the ways that those two studies have framed it, then the result is not factual. It's it's an agenda. It's ideologically driven, economically self-serving agenda. And that's not helpful. I'm thinking about how we report on climate policy and oil and gas, and there are a lot of gaps. So for any journalists listening in, are there considerations they should take into account when reporting on these topics? And for both of you, are welcome to, to answer on that. I could start. Basically, there are two things I would advise any journalist reporting on oil and gas that beat in Canada these days. First, based on my experience and based on the reports I've seen, take the industry-funded reports with a serious amount of skepticism. The assumptions that go into those reports 
are more or less garbage and therefore the results that come out are also garbage. So ask somebody that really knows about modeling, ask somebody that really knows about the oil and gas sector, what kinds of assumptions have gone into the report before believing the conclusions that come out of the report. That's the first thing. Second, understand that the demand for the products of the oil and gas sectors are going to be peaking within this decade, according to any reputable analyst. You know, if we, as long as we're not referring to OPEC and their predictions, any reputable analyst says those the global demand is going to be peaking for those products this decade or shortly thereafter, and then entering a, a decline post 2030. So think about that. Think about the risk to the Canadian economy which is highly bound up in these sectors. Uh, the, the exposure of our mutual funds, our banking system, our financial system to these sectors is frightening. Think about what that means for those sectors if all of a sudden the assets of the oil and gas companies that they've invested so heavily in become stranded assets, become uh, assets that no longer have value. That's a serious problem. So evaluate all of the policies through that lens. And as an example, the emissions cap evaluated through that lens is not such a bad policy, even if it did limit production growth to less than the ambitious levels that the oil and gas companies would like it. It is avoiding a catastrophic train wreck of unmanaged oil and gas decline within this country. So any policies that are trying to force a managed transition are trying to avoid that massive economic train wreck. That's my second piece of advice. Evaluate all the policies through the lens of what we know is going to happen in the oil and gas sectors over the next couple of decades. Yeah, I would totally agree with you, Aaron, in terms of you know, managing the transition. And I, I think there is sort of this idea out there that reduced oil and gas demand is, is an option, like a policy option or a choice that some government is going to make. And that's just simply not true. The, 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 the demand is dropping. The transition is underway. All we can do now is respond, react, prepare, and manage. You know, and one of the things I think that I would I would like to see, you know, media coverage and, and, and climate reporters kind of focus on in Canada in particular has been so much attention on the federal government in terms of its carbon pricing, its clean electricity regulations, its emission cap, et cetera, et cetera. But the provinces have a significant role and significant responsibility, especially when it comes to oil and gas developments, infrastructure developments, pipelines, et cetera. And also with respect to their electricity grids in terms of what, you know, how they're going to grow their electricity grids, how they're going to maintain their electricity grids and expand them as electricity demand grows. You know, we just saw the premiers out on the East Coast talking about how the federal government needs to stay in its lane. Well, I mean, the provinces have quite a very large lane to drive in. They have a very large role, a very large responsibility in promoting climate action in putting options on out there for their constituents to take advantage of in terms of EV rebates, in terms of access to um, financing options and grants and low interest loans for energy retrofits, for tr transitioning their homes, whether it's from heating oil or diesel or, or natural gas, getting energy systems in communities onto clean renewable, electrified, affordable energy. These are the things that are going to have a real impact on people's lives. And it's going to start to create a sea change in communities' understandings of how climate action can actually improve their lives, lower the cost for them. There are a lot of problems that we could focus on in terms of, you know, the oil and gas industry. And, and, and we need to focus on those problems. We need to think about what that energy transition is going to look like for the oil and gas sector and how to how to protect the workers, how to how to protect those communities that are like really entrenched in, in that infrastructure and how to you know manage that transition. There's also a ton of solutions out there. And I think we really need to grab onto those solutions and start putting them in place visibly in our communities, in our homes, in our neighborhoods, at, at our, our parking lots with you know electric vehicle plug-in stations. We need to start making the solutions more visible and more accessible for people so they can actually see the, the future that we're that we can head towards. 
I always come back to the Newfoundland Labrador example of this, which was cod fishery collapse, right? Like, I think yes. we're, we're on the edge of something very similar here if we don't act ahead of time and make that transition easier for, for instance, workers who are going to need to transition to another industry. I'm curious for both of you, for your reports, for the work you've done on this, where can people find out more? Our International Institute for Sustainable Development website, iifd.org, is full of fantastic information and reports um, related to our Canada Energy Program, also our international programs, other country programs around the world. Of course, I would start with ISD's website. There are a bunch of other good actors within Canada that are doing work on these issues, as you know. I would particularly highlight the Pembina Institute if we're talking about oil and gas in Canada because they're based in Alberta. They understand the, they understand the sector well and have been doing excellent work. But also, also on methane, I would look to the David Suzuki Foundation. Um, in general, Climate Action Network in Canada has good policy advice. Environmental defense is excellent on fossil fuel subsidies. There are a number of good actors in Canada uh, in terms of policy advice on uh, oil and gas sector and uh, fossil fuels and affordability, frankly. But of course, start with the International Institute for Sustainable Development. Thank you so much, both of you, for joining me today. I really appreciate it. It was a pleasure. Yeah, thank you so much. Hi, everybody. Connor Curtis, Head of Communications here, jumping in to do the Q&A for this podcast episode. And before we get into it, I just want to say that the answers we provide here are just on behalf of ourselves. They don't reflect the views of our guests. And we have a question for today's episode. There is already Canadian legislation against false advertising, like the Competition Act and maybe others. Why is the new anti-greenwashing law having such a profound effect? And I think what the person is referring to here is the fact that after this greenwashing law came into place, we saw major lobbying websites for the oil and gas industry like Pathways Alliance and CAP bring down large portions of their website, maybe their entire website and social media feeds. And so this is a big thing because obviously if you see this greenwashing law passing and then suddenly uh, there's a lot of lobby groups out there scrubbing everything they have why would that happen i can't speak to exactly why they chose to to do that although i think it's extremely suspicious <laughs> to say the least but i will say this in that greenwashing law there is a specific clause that means that they have to have proof to back up claims. They have to have actual evidence, which is a bit different than previous and other laws. And if you don't have evidence, then that leaves you open to potentially a lot of different uh, things underneath the law. And that's probably a factor that anybody's going to be taking into account when making those sorts of decisions. So it's a bit of a short Q&A today. I'm going to add a couple of other things that are not directly connected to this question that I want to talk about. The first of which is, we know that the oil and gas industry as a whole has a long history of misleading the public about the impacts of climate change, about the seriousness of climate change, and about what they were doing to reduce their emissions. That is very well documented that they've been misleading the public. So there is a lot of evidence there overall that the industry has been a bad actor globally. It's certainly done things in Canada that are, I think, extremely problematic. We've seen definitely a lot of claims made that turned out not to be the case by oil and gas industries and by their affiliates. What we want to try about too is there is a specific role here. So so the oil and gas industry is about 5% of our economy, but they are responsible for 27 to 30% of our national emissions. This is a huge contribution to the emissions that Canada produces, and it's one of the reasons why we have very high per capita emissions. It's not individuals' actions per se that lead to that. It is the actions of this one very large industry that tend to put us behind other countries in terms of bringing down our emissions and in terms of actually meeting emissions targets. And Canada has a significant historical and continuing contribution to global emissions. There is a role there for us to play. It is important, but it's not specifically on individuals to play that role. And if you want to understand what that role is, well, 13 Canadian oil and gas companies, including five of the six that make up the Pathways Alliance, Oil Sands Lobby Group, are on a list of 88 big carbon polluters that have been called out for a major share of the forested lands lost to wildfires in North America between 1986 and 2021. There is a direct correlation between Canadian oil companies, Canadian oil and gas companies, and the wildfires we see across North America. And it is 
directly there. It is something that has been studied and it's important that we get to work talking about the actual impacts here and that we actually have real conversations, as we talked about in this podcast, about the downsides of continued dependency on oil and gas. You can find out a lot more by going to sierraclub.ca. We have fact sheets on wildfires, we have fact sheets on the emissions cap that are worth checking out. You can also check out some of our previous podcast episodes that get into some of the misinformation about other climate policies. Before we go, just a reminder that you can take action on environmental issues by visiting sierraclub.ca. We have tons of petitions, including a petition directly on the emissions cap that you can sign, other actions and regular news updates you can sign up for on the homepage. You can also find Sierra Club Canada on social media and you can listen to the Environment in Canada podcast on the Harbinger Media Network, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, iHeartRadio and YouTube or wherever you get your podcast. This podcast is also broadcast on CKUT Broadcast Radio in Montreal, 90.3 FM, bi-weekly on Tuesdays at 11 a.m. ET. Don't forget to click follow or subscribe so you get the latest episodes from us. And last but not least, do check out, if you're not already subscribed to our regular newsletters, some interesting events coming up near you as of the publication of this podcast. You can find those on our Facebook page at Sierra Club Canada. 